I think all great sitcoms, the sitcoms that I love, are completely uh, unique. Uh, I think I Love Lucy is unique, and I think the relationship between Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore was unique, and I think the f people they invented in the Cheers bar were unique, and Larry Sanders is unique. And so I would hate to say, oh, well, all the American ones are the same, because I think they're miles apart. There's just a million miles between Friends and Larry Sanders, in the same way that it would be ridiculous to say that, yes, Prime Minister had much to do with Ab Fab or, you know, Father Ted. Um, I think we just have got these lucky little novels of funny stuff, and I don't think they uh, don't think it really matters which country they come from. One of the laws of newspapers seems to be that every six months someone has to write an article about the death of sitcom, and I think that they're I think they're all nonsense because my as far as I can see, there have been about three great sitcoms in Britain and about three great sitcoms in America every ten years, and the pattern is pretty well the same. I sort of can't imagine what they are, but I think that about every decade you get a few that people adore and it will, with any luck, always stay the same. But now we've got some good sitcoms, now in America we've got some good sitcoms, uh, and I think as many as ever there were. I'm very passionate about Larry Sanders, which is a very strange, weird, uncomfortable sitcom with no laughter, but is brilliantly funny and seems to always drift off in a direction you don't expect it to and be full of strange sadnesses just around the corner with all the major characters. And I loved Father Ted. I loved Father Ted for the sweetness of the characters, in fact. I mean, apart from the bloke in the chair, the two main characters just trying so hard to be nice to each other and so, so Ardell's character so thick. A great joy. Forty Towers, it's the greatest farce ever written in the English language. I think there might be some good French farces, but there's not been anything that perfect in the history of English literature. I mean, it's just uh, so funny. Sitcom plots are very gorgeous to create. You don't have plots and sketches, and film plots are really dull to try and get right. It's such a long time, it's such a huge curve, the characters have to be so deep. The thing I miss about sitcom is not writing funny lines or writing funny scenes, but just devising a perfect little circle. I think that's the, that is the, that is the, fun, of, the fun of the genre. The only advice I ever give to people about writing sitcoms is if they possibly can, don't write a first episode. For the last three series of Back Adder, we never wrote a first episode. We wrote a final episode and five other ones so that you could pick a good one to go first. Because on the whole, first episodes of sitcoms are the worst because you don't establish the situation you're going for, you establish the situation before the one that you were going for. And that is the sadness that most sitcoms are reviewed on the back of their first episode, which is the one where the old flatmate moves out and the new flatmate moves in and they should be there should be a rule that they're only reviewed after three of them you know so that you kind of find out what the joke is meant to be i've liked those sitcoms that i like i find it alarming that people are so keen to write about sitcoms they don't like rather than celebrate sitcoms they do so you know i think um, we were still in love with how Forty Towers had been. I would imagine that Yes, Prime Minister was around and being fantastic in those days. So what I was trying to do was write a sitcom like the ones I liked, um, not an attack on those I didn't like. And Forty Towers was a huge um, barrier to writing anything in those days because it had just been so good, as it turns out, it's the most popular TV program ever. Um, that after a while we decided that the one thing we could do is perhaps write a historical sitcom which wouldn't re remind everyone how um, weak we were in comparison to Forty Towers. I wonder if other people would admit to this. I think the most difficult thing about all sitcoms is that you write so hard and you get your little series of six as perfect as you possibly can. And in retrospect, it seems to me that every sitcom I've ever written out of six, two are good, two are not bad, and two are awful. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how well you do it, I certainly know which is which in, um, in all the Blackadder and Vicar of Dibley series. They're just, some of them don't work. Plots aren't made in heaven. Some of them do. BBC cancelled the Blackadder after the first series, said that we weren't allowed to do the second series. It was extremely unsuccessful and not funny enough. And then I met Ben, and Ben and I talked about the fact that it would have been possible to do Blackadder in a really traditional studio context. And so that's what we did. I don't think there's any outside filming 
at all, apart from the credit sequence in the Elizabethan one. I don't think there isn't any of them, actually. Uh, and so that was a new challenge, new fun, and it came out much more, as it were, like a play than like a film. Some sitcom writers sit together in the same room. Ben and I never sat together in the same room because whenever we sat together in the same room, we could find so many subjects that were more interesting than... <laughs> I seem to remember, during those years, we were obsessed by Madonna, Kylie, and Madness. These were our three. So we only talked about pop. We get to the end of the meeting and go, oh, God, we haven't mentioned the Black Adam once. And then we'd go away again. And so we were, this was the first sort of computerized writing. I'd give him a disc. He'd give me the disc back, backwards and forwards, with this one rule that you were never allowed to put back in something that the other person had cut, on the grounds that if you tell a joke at dinner, and nobody laughs, you don't say, oh, no, no, wait, sorry, this no, it was absolutely hilarious, wait, I'll tell it to you again. You accept the fact that it hasn't worked. So even though sometimes he and I both believe rather good stuff got thrown out, it did lead to a very harmonious writing where you just never went backwards, you always went forwards. Ben gave it a certain linguistic wildness and a certain uh, naughtiness and wickedness, which I very quickly started to imitate, but I think that his initial contribution to stick the writer of the young ones into a historical sitcom probably made it only able to happen when it, when it did. And one of the things that's so sort of cheeky and pleasant about it is that it's obviously written by someone very much of our time, even though it is consistently historical. I don't think we ever had any ac anachronistic jokes. That was our big promise that we wouldn't have any jokes. Hello, Mr. Fortnum, meet Mr. Mason, all those jokes. I think I like the ludicrous lavishness of the words in Blackadder. I think in the end that's what I particularly enjoy. Um, I think the relationship between uh, Rowan and Tony uh, developed to be a good, fun, traditional sitcom relationship. And I think the fact that it was historical meant that it was, one, pretty to look at, and two, that things were happening in half hours which didn't usually happen. People were being beheaded, people were invading nations, people were dying at war and all of that. So I think all of that added up to a slightly different uh, brew to a lot of shows. We were very strongly advised, we were very strongly advised not to do Blackadder. We were told that the two things that absolutely never, ever worked, and everybody tried, were sitcoms set in heaven. <laughs> at historical sitcoms, um, but we uh, ignored the advice. To some extent, Blackadder is a joke about the history that we were taught when we were young. Um, when series two, for which we did no research, was finished, I gave Ben as a birthday part, a present, the Ladybird book of Elizabethan history, which had 13 chapters of which we'd covered 11 or something like that. It was just all the little bits of nonsense we remembered from school um, that we'd included in it. Um, the reason we did the historical one was twofold. We did it because we were scared of Faulty Towers, and I just couldn't imagine putting Rowan in a jacket and being anything but embarrassed by how less, much less funny he was than Basil Faulty. And second, because we liked the idea of, of big plots, we liked the idea of death and carnage and kings and princes and chaos, rather than just writing about um, your car breaking down. As it went on, Black had a change. It changed between the first and second series. But talking about the second, third, and fourth series, um, there was enormous joy in the plots of them as well. There was an enormous joy in trying to set up some great, big, huge problem. Uh, and they were great, big, huge problems of kings getting married and getting jobs that you weren't suitable for and sailing around the world and all that kind of stuff. And trying to turn a big plot corner in half an hour was a lot of fun and cracking as many stupid jokes as we possibly could, really. It was a lot of fun right, working with Ben, working with two people. We never sat in a room, we never agonised about it. All that would happen is I would send Ben a disc with my first go, and then he'd send it back, and I'd get to laugh at all his jokes, and then I'd cross out all the things of his that I didn't like, and of mine that I'd grown bored with, and pass it back. So it was a, it was a great pleasure. It was like getting um, funny letters from a friend. I think it was by chance that Blackadder 2 and 3 ended with Blackadder getting killed. We couldn't think of any other way out. But Series 4, we did do it very much on purpose because we were very keen to do World War I. But it's recent history and terrible and tragic recent history. And so our deal with ourselves was that we would do it as long as we would kill all the characters, which is sort of what happened in the First World War. It was actually full of 
wonderful clashes of class and strangenesses in the trenches, but their men did go over the top and die. And we felt that or hoped that if we did do that, really, at the end of the episode, it would not be too disrespectful and would actually re represent some of the tragedy of the, of the First World War. So that was on purpose. Um, yeah, I think the thing about um, the Black Adders was that Ben knows a lot about history and was much more aware of the history than I was. Um, and so we were quite interested in the history, even though we didn't research it properly. And therefore, it seemed to us a completely logical uh, end to a sitcom about the war, rather than a brave or heretical thing to do. So um, I think that was where the history and the comedy uh, formed an interesting combination. The first series we did because we were looking for a place full of medieval head hacking and stuff like that, and we sort of found somewhere in the 14th century. Second one, we decided to make it, um, you know, a proper sitcom in a sitcom studio. And I think, therefore, we were looking for something courtly and confined. And we knew more about Elizabeth I than other eras. And there was something also vaguely Shakespearean about it, which we liked. Um, and then I think we picked the third one because it was another famous area of English drama. I think sort of restoration comedy was the thing that that reminded us of. And perhaps there'd been a series called Prince Regent or something on the telly, which we remembered, so they still had the costumes. Um, and then series four, I think we thought long and hard. And by that time, we'd started to define what made Blackadder work. And the idea of a very confined space where he was up against a huge machine above him that he could kick against but never defeat. Um, so we'd sort of learnt the formula then. We've got other ideas we might do one day in our 70s. We always found when we did the sitcoms that the fewer extra characters we had and the fewer extra places we went for some reason or other, the funnier they were. And I think the fact that Black Out of Four was so confined, more than any of the other series, really, meant in the end that the relationships between the people are more satisfying. Baldrick's actually a rather tragic figure, I think, all the way through it, because he really does seem to appear to represent the working man who's been really screwed over by the system. And George is such a touching figure the whole way through that I think that, that it being really confined led to the interrelationships being more touching and more interesting, partly because the plots were less big. You always had on your mind whether or not something could lead to a plot. So if you were thinking about, particularly in the Elizabethan one, you would think, oh, well, there were potatoes or there were Puritans or there were executioners. And from that, you would then think, oh, well, is there any kind of little plot I can do about an executioner or about a voyage of discovery? Um, and uh, that was just part of what was on your mind during the four or three months that you were writing it. And I don't know how the plots worked from there, how we got them to work. But it was just one of the jobs that you joyfully did. When we got the character of Blackadder right, which it wasn't really right in the first series, we were using this thing that Rowan does extraordinarily, which is just irony, sarcasm, distance, all those. He used to do some fantastic sketches. He did a great one as a schoolmaster, a great one as a father of the bride who was being incredibly rude about his new son-in-law. Uh, and so you kind of knew that you could be as rude as you liked, as scornful as you liked, and that Roe would be funny doing it, and so that was a joy. When we did the first series, we had huge cinematic dreams, and so we got ourselves just technically in a very dodgy situation, which was that there was no audience, and we'd always worked in front of an audience. It was recorded in a studio or out on film, so we didn't quite know what we were doing. We realised on the very first day's filming that we didn't know what Rowan's character was. <laughs> we had a huge argument whether or not he should play him as a sort of real aristocratic idiot. I remember on day one, and finally we decided that would just mean that lots of it didn't work. So I think we were replaced with rather a lot of characters during the course of the series. So we hadn't really defined that. We hadn't defined the relationship with Baldwin. So I think there are some things about it which are fun, and some bits of the script which are funny, and some sort of hugenesses that are rather, rather sort of gorgeous in terms of witches and bishops and stuff. But we hadn't really worked out how to do the sitcom job yet. We considered the second series a success because the BBC commissioned a third series because after the first one, they hadn't commissioned a second one. Um, but it, as always, it took time to get um, into the public 
um, domain, as it were. Uh, the second, you know, the third series and the fourth series, I think, won BAFTA awards, but the second series, which is in some ways the best, I don't think even got nominated because it takes people time to realise they've liked something. I suppose I love moments with, of unexpected emotion. I think almost my favourite bits are Percy being very, very wounded about not being asked to be best man and attempting to hide his emotions of excitement when he thinks he's been asked and of disappointment when it turns out someone else has been asked. I love, I love that. Um, the final episode of series four I love, but I like the middle chunk where they're reminiscing about what their lives were like, which seems to me something we'd never done to look back over our characters. My one great regret about 40 Towers is I think it's a shame that we never had any... I wish he'd written one episode where someone who knew them when they were young, when they got engaged or when they got married, someone who brought back the past because those characters were so frozen into their middle age, would have been wonderful to get a glimpse of what they'd been like. The guy who he turned down when he employed Manuel. Um, I mean, I think that... So I love that episode of... Um, Four and in three, uh, and I love um, in series one. Uh, some of the guest people have done fantastic performances. I think Rick Mail's performance in series two was fantastic, the most energetic thing I've ever seen. And Jim Broadbent's performance in series one as the Spanish interpreter has the weirdest inflection you've ever heard on television, and is absolutely, um, absolutely gorgeous. And then I think there's a good scene with the squirrel in series three. We finished the part for um, Rick Mail as Flashheart, and he didn't perform a single line that we wrote. I mean, I gave it to him, and he said, you, you know, write something funny. Uh, so we had to push and push and push to give him this basically series of crude innuendo one-liners, which I so adore. Um, and certainly Miranda Richardson's contribution was extraordinary. We auditioned a lot of people to do uh, her part we couldn't get anyone who didn't either do it as a kind of posh, as a slow ranger, or as a sort of 12-year-old girl. And then Miranda did this insane, undefinable thing, but nothing that we'd written really suited it. It was just so much better than anything we had written, so we had to rewrite the whole part for the sort of oblique weirdness of her, of her performance. I think that one of the things that is, uh, was educational for me in the end of the Blackadder is how close you can bring comedy to uh, tragedy in uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, which is originally called Four Weddings and a Honeymoon and had an awful bit with, with Hugh Grant padding around a, a beach hiding behind notice boards trying to watch Andy McDowell. Um, and I worked out, you know, in that we found out that you could absolutely go comedy, comedy, comedy and then straight into the tragedy and then straight out of it again. And I think one of the lessons of Blackadder 4 is how far you can push it. We really, I think there's one serious line. I think Rowan says, good luck, chaps, or something. But until then, we tried to crack jokes till the very last moment, and yet still were able to be serious. And I think that, you know, seriousness is, uh, and comedy are, are very, they're not very far apart. Well, they don't need to be. What I mean is if you're, if you're being funny, you're then allowed to be tragic. And if you're being tragic, you're definitely allowed to be funny. Shakespeare does it, I say all the time, but twice. There were lots of reasons why we didn't um, write any more Blackadders, and we've got a few up our sleeve. We were always going to write one set in the 60s called The Black Out of Five, where Rome was going to play a kind of CD manager stroke exploiter stroke photographer stroke pop musician and it was going to transpire that it was Baldrick who'd shot President Kennedy um, while playing with a gun in a Dallas hotel waiting for the Black Out of Five to give a dodgy concert. But one of the main reasons we didn't do it again was because we found we were parodying ourselves. We were still so aware, we'd left a lot of time and so aware of the structures that we created as, you know, you are as stupid as, and I would rather do this than, and all of those, that we got to the point where it wasn't so much coming out of us as us thinking, oh, what normally happens is. And I think the moment you start following a ground plan rather than writing your own jokes, you're in, um, probably in trouble. It's up to other people to judge, as it were, the curve of your career. I think that you write the next thing you want to write, and the next thing that I wanted to write after 
Blackadder was something. I mean, I, was, I lived in a village in the country for 10 years. I was intrigued by that. I was interested in women vicars. Um, I wanted to write um, something about someone nice, and so that was what I wrote. Maybe if I write another sitcom, it will be gorgeously radical. I was very keen in the Vicar of Dibley to write about the difficulty of being nice. I, I don't think there are very many uh, nasty people in the world. I think most of us try and be nice. And most of the comedy in our lives comes from the awful problem of how to be polite about dreadful things that have happened, how to be nice to your relatives, how to be friendly, how not to be rude to guests, to try and you know be pleasant to people. Um, and I think that that is just as funny an idea as somebody like in Blackadder who just shouts at everybody who ever walks in. And so I was trying to find someone who was definitively nice, in fact compelled to be nice. And the point about being a vicar is you absolutely have to be nice to everybody, it's your job. So that was one of the reasons we did it. Um, the second, uh, it was probably the Vicar of Dibley was the only political act of my life insofar as I went to a registry wedding where a woman was officiating and it struck me as being so correct that a woman should do it. I was just 100% convinced that women vicars were a good idea because you know, so many women in my life have been so good at dealing with the complex emotional things that uh, people go through and that's exactly what a vicar should be able to deal with. Uh, and so I was keen to write something which just showed a woman vicar because I thought if other people had an experience of it, a fictional experience, they would suddenly realize this is completely right, it's completely natural. Uh, and what I was eager to do is get something out into the marketplace that made this common currency and so people would have something to refer to and would say, well, you're mad to say that there's something wrong with female vicars because even though that's a silly comedy, uh, it makes sense emotionally to me. I've done two things that I, I mourn like lost children. One of them was the Madness sitcom that Ben and I tried to write, where we did a pilot. We were very keen on Madness. Um, we did a pilot, but it was not a very good pilot because it only lasted seven minutes and was filmed on a very grey day. Um, but it would have been a joy to do what they'd done with the monkeys with Madness. And, but unfortunately, our pilot was nothing like as good as one of their videos, so it didn't come off. Uh, I'm sorry that didn't happen. And I did once write the pilot and film the pilot of something called The Chip Show, which was a a sort of, not a sitcom, but a show set in an Italian restaurant. It was called The Chip Show because it was very cheap. Um, and cheap and chip were meant to be how it sounded if you said an Italian accent. And it starred Miriam Margulies, Jim Broadbent, Tim McInerney and Tony Robinson. And should have been absolutely fantastic, but we filmed it without an audience and it was just completely weird. But I wish I had the pilot still, because I'm sure there were some good jokes in it. When sitcoms are lovely, they are the most perfect form and length of television. I'm a great lover of television. Something that lasts half an hour and makes you laugh is so perfect. It doesn't interfere with the flow of your evening. You can still talk to your family. And as a little sort of injection of joy into your life, I don't think you can do much better. I mean, over the years, watching Forty Towers, watching Young Ones, watching recently watching Larry Sanders, just gives me so much pleasure. <laughs>